focus with Ajaz Heather. Top of the menu this evening is our discussion of Sino-U.S. relations. Speaking at the annual Boao Forum for Asia, Chinese President Xi Jinping criticized some countries that seek to decouple and build barriers between states. He said such policies do harm and benefit no one. China has long called for reforms of the global governance system to better reflect a more diverse range of perspectives and values from the international community, including its own. Beijing says the current architecture reflects and protects the interests of a few major nations. The world wants justice, not hegemony, she said in remarks broadcast to the forum. While he did not identify any country in his remarks, Chinese officials have in recent times referred to U.S. hegemony and public criticism of Washington's global projection of power in trade and geopolitics. Last Friday, U.S. President Joe Biden held his first face-to-face -face White House summit meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. China topped the agenda. Both leaders said they share serious concerns about the human rights situation in Hong Kong and China's Xinjiang region. China has denied abuses. In a display of economic cooperation to the exclusion of China, Biden said Japan and the United States would jointly invest in areas such as 5G technology, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, genomics, and semiconductor supply chains. Interestingly, China is the biggest trading partner of Japan, Australia, South Korea, Germany, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Russia, EU, to name a few. For the U.S. itself, China is the second largest after Mexico. For France, China is the second biggest export market. China is India's biggest trading partner, despite tensions. China is also the central force behind regional comprehensive economic partnership. The 15 member countries account for about 30% of the world's population, that's about 2.2 billion people, and 30% of the global GDP, that's about $26.2 trillion, making it the biggest trade bloc in history. She will also be participating in the two-day virtual climate summit convened by Biden. It will be the two leaders' first meeting. To discuss the areas of convergence and diversity, I'm joined by Dr. Rolly Lal, Associate Professor at the Elliott School of International Affairs, George Washington University, and Aina Tangan, Political and Economic Affairs Commentator based in Beijing. Let me begin with Professor Lal here. So, Professor Lal, uh, the structural railers are very clear and they say, well, you, you know, you, you're locked in a trap. Uh, call it the securities trap or whatever kind of trap, if you will, but there is a trap. On the other hand, there are lots of people who think that given all these uh, economic interdependencies and the rest, perhaps we can be a little more optimistic. What is your view of the situation? Well, I certainly think that there are possibilities to be optimistic. I don't think that um, all of our national leaders are working in that direction necessarily at this point. Now, there are a lot of moving parts, though. So under the Trump administration, there were some very harsh measures already taken against China. So Biden, President Biden is in a difficult situation where he has to think about how to unwind some of this, while at the same time trying to make sure that he sends a signal to the United States and to China that human rights is still very, very important and he's not letting down um, the guard on that. So it's, it's really walking a very, very thin, tight, tight rope for him. Um, but, it, you know, if he could manage to uh, work more closely with the Chinese, I, I think that our Secretary of State has been possibly a little too harsh. I frankly think that um, maybe uh, starting off the new Biden administration with um, a friendlier approach towards China d while keeping up the criticism may be a better method. Because right now we are uh, currently headed in a direction of more of a Cold War type rhetoric, which we'd like to stay away from. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I want to uh, keep aside the human rights issue for a while because I think there is a, there's a lot of cherry picking there by the United States. Uh, there are various other countries where the U.S. could talk about uh, human rights violations. I mean, the State Department does, but not in the, in the way that that's being done vis-a-vis -vis China. I mean, I can give you the example of what India is doing in, in Kashmir. But leaving that aside, uh, let's take up another issue, which is the freedom of navigation operations, the phone ops that the U.S. Navy does. Now, 
the frequency and aggression of those phone ops in South China Sea, for instance, have increased, uh, you know, recently in the last two years or so. Now, I just quoted figures, uh, you know, uh, just a sort of uh, bird's eye view of, uh, of the kind of trade that China is doing and listed a number of countries uh, which are the largest trading partners of China. Now, how would the United States justify phone ops in uh, South China Sea uh, if we just simply look at the, the basic premise that it is in the interest of China to ensure that sea lanes of communication remain open? Well, I think that this is, of course, an issue of contentious debate for the countries of Southeast Asia itself. And, and that's the issue at hand here, is that uh, China does uh, perceive that it should be responsible for the security of that uh, area of the seas. Uh, the US <clears throat> feels that it's somewhat responsible through its alliances and relationships with countries in Southeast Asia who are concerned about the possibility of Chinese hegemony. Um, you have other countries other than even Southeast Asia who are concerned that what if China decided to shut down traffic in that, uh, in that area. So the, the, the issue of contention here is that not everyone actually agrees that China should be policing the seas. Okay, uh, let's take this to Aina Tangan here. Aina Tangan, um, I want you to square the circle for me. Uh, you are heavily dependent on trade that goes through these slots. Uh, at the same time, as uh, Dr. Lal is saying, there's concern in the United States and also in the literal states, South China Sea, that China might uh, blockade, uh, you know, a navigation in these seas. Uh, is that something that uh, you think Beijing is likely to do at some point? Well, not unless it wants to commit suicide. Uh, quite frankly, the South China Sea disputes uh, are regarding uh, land. Uh, not land, I mean uh, sea rights and things like that. It's not about uh, navigation. Uh, that is a complete uh, red herring. Uh, quite frankly, the U.S. is just trying to uh, hang on to its hegemony and to project itself as a large power, despite the fact that it uh, never joined UNCLOS, the UN Convention of Laws of the Seas, which it always uh, cites, but is not a member of. Uh, for China to shut down those sea lanes, which means it would not be able to bring in the resources it badly needs. Um, the per person resources in China is about in the middle of the pack, around 100 um, you know, down. And uh, quite frankly, it wouldn't be able to export the value added goods uh, that's necessary for its export trade. So uh, that, that is a zero chance that, that would happen. Uh, what China fears is quite the opposite that the U.S., with 400 bases uh, surrounding that area, uh, would, in fact, try to blockade or interfere uh, with Chinese resources coming in or trade going out. That is why they came up with this uh, land-based route uh, that has uh, you know, also been attacked as something undesirable by the United States. So China sees itself trying to avoid the Euclidean trap uh, by not being boxed in, and they see the, the U.S. trying to hang on to, uh, you know, kind of a post-World War II hegemony um, uh, against, uh, you know, the motion of time and tide, which says that we're moving towards a multipolar world. Uh, Professor Lal, uh, you know, it, it's very clear from what the, what the Chinese say that, uh, A, it's not about navigation. Uh, B, uh, it's a very important issue that uh, the U.S. is not a member of one clause, although it does accept it as customary international law. Uh, and, and also, uh, the United States, even when its Navy wasn't really strong enough, I mean, the, the, the British Navy was much stronger, and yet the United States established what today we call the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, so... It seems to me uh, fairly, uh, you know, justified, uh, you know, if we, if we use the U.S. example for China to want to uh, not be policed by an external state actor in its backyard. 
Well, yes, I, I can see how its perspective would be. However, I think that the whole thing is um, a bit more complex than even the Chinese and the, and the U.S. would like to believe. Now, both China and the U.S. are currently major powers. Now, if you, we're really talking about democratization of the international space, then technically, um, actually, we would need to have a greater seat for both Japan and India when we're talking about Asia, uh, maybe even Indonesia, for example. So, so I think that when we're having this conversation, it's interesting that we feed into the rhetoric of the bipolar, of the uh, you know, Cold War thinking. It's either China or the US that has control over the seas. And I don't think that's really where we need to be going in the world today. I'm happy to note that we are slowly but surely uh, <laughs> getting close to structural realism. But let me ask you something else. So there was uh, some years ago, uh, Earl Morris did a documentary on uh, Robert McNamara. Uh, it was called The Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert Strange McNamara. And one of the first lessons that McNamara talked about was to empathize with the enemy or the adversary. Now, it seems to me uh, that right now, inside the Beltway, there is very little appetite for actually emphasizing or looking at the issues from China's perspective. Uh, it seems to be the same old template on which the Beltway is, is falling again. Well, I would have to admit, I think that you're kind of right. Um, I do think that inside the Beltway, uh, things are moving in that direction. Uh, nonetheless, I have to say the, the error is not only on the US's side. Um, I think that the Chinese also have to think more in terms of how to bring uh, others into the circle and also look at how some of its issues are making it difficult for the US. So for example, some of these issues such as human rights, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, make it very difficult um, for the US to move much closer, much more quickly. Now, having said that, inside the Beltway, when people see the size of China's economy, its capabilities of Huawei and 5G technology, the inroads it's making inside of Asia and across the world, I think that it does make people nervous because they don't know what to make of it. Uh, now, I personally think that the best approach is to focus on the inside in the U.S. and find ways of being more competitive. Um, and I think that would be a much more uh, effective technique than taking on China as a, a battle of words, so to speak. So I think this has to be thought about much more um, insightfully inside of Washington, but also inside of Beijing in terms of how can we break out of this type of uh, context into a more cooperative one. There are a lot of places we can cooperate, uh, environment, trade, development around the world. There are many, many areas that I think these two countries can um, you know, create a lot of great outcomes. So I'm hoping that we can start trying to build on that. And we might need the right people in the right offices to be able to pull that off. Right. Um, obviously, there are areas of convergence. Climate is one. As I said, Xi Jinping tomorrow will be part of that two-day climate, uh, virtual climate summit. Um, but then there were areas of cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union, also non-proliferation being one of the top such areas. But obviously, confrontation state. Now, I'm going to come back to the technology part of it. But let me take the human rights issue back to Aina Tangan here. Aina Tangan, Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghurs is a big issue, as is Hong Kong. Give us your perspective, a region's perspective, on these issues. Uh, quite frankly, in, in Beijing or in China and much of Asia, human rights is about economic rights. Uh, it's, it's about safety in the streets. Uh, being safe in your home, uh, being uh, having economic opportunity, access to medical, uh, improving lifestyles, education. Uh, these are the things that uh, if you ask people in the streets of, of China, anywhere, whether it's in the city or the countryside, this is what they would talk about. Uh, in the West, uh, in developed countries, I should say, uh, democratic ones, uh, human rights is always about a ballot box and a, uh, the ability to say whatever you want. 
But this, unfortunately, is a, a you know, chasm that is very hard to fill. Both sides feel that they are right. Uh, China feels that uh, the U.S. is trying to basically incite at the corners, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, in Tibet, and claim that the, there are human rights there. In fact, all of those, uh, Taiwan uh, pretty much has uh, developed because of China, but in all other three areas, they're completely dependent on, on China in the sense that their econ economies have just burgeoned over the last 30 years. Uh, the fact is, the, you know, China feels very strongly that Washington is trying to scapegoat it for its own incompetencies. And they feel that there's a very strong sense of hypocrisy that is going on here. Why, why is it, you know, Joe Biden, the, he was holding a press conference with Sugar. The first question asked is, what are you going to do about these mass shootings and guns? I mean, that tells you that the U.S. Uh, and, you know, the attack on the Capitol is a nation divided. And it's, yet it's not turning its attention inwards towards the human rights of the people, uh, you know, these African-Americans and other minorities, Asians who are being attacked. Instead, you have, you know, half the politicians going out talking about replacement theory, this idea that whites are being replaced by minorities, by immigrants. This is not a nation that can lead by example. And this is where the hypocrisy comes in. And I think this will be Biden's lasting legacy. If, if Trump was post-truth, Biden will be post-hypocrisy. Yeah, I understand. And I mean, I, I uh, you know, some of the points that you have made with reference to the United States. But you would also agree that the United States has allowed people from across the world, almost from every part of the world, to come there. And whoever has worked hard has been able to, uh, you know, make something off that. Um, I'm not saying that there's no class issue. I'm not saying that there are not racial tensions and the rest of it. All of that is there. No, no place is perfect. Uh, but so, so the United States has spaces for dissent. Now, uh, the thing is, as, you know, with reference to Xinjiang, with reference to, I'm not talking about Taiwan for now, but Hong Kong, there was a certain kind of uh, settled agreement. Uh, people seem to think that under Xi Jinping, Beijing has unnecessarily uh, is trying to, you know, destroy that. In Xinjiang, uh, what China calls re-education camps, others think are camps where people are being brainwashed, uh, incarcerated, and so on. So it's got nothing to do with the ballot part. It's about some very basic human dignities and, uh, and rights. So, so do you think there is reason for Beijing to, for instance, say, okay, let's not talk about what the U.S. says, but let's look inwards and, and see whether what we are doing to, to the people is the right thing to do. Ijaz, I agree with you. And I, I've said many times on this show and every show that I'm on that the best solution here is to shed uh, sunlight on this, to um, in, invite uh, press groups from around the world to come to Xinjiang and, and see what is going on. Hong Kong is a different matter. They, they had to act. You, you had chaos in the streets, people being killed, um, you know, commerce being interrupted, uh, the lives of five million people who depended on uh, uh, on tourism trade were basically cut off. Uh, now, this was uh, there were a lot of people who were in favor of this, but doesn't necessarily make it right. The first duty of a country, of a government, is to uh, provide a safe place for people to be. And that does not extend to violent riots where people or thugs are breaking down into businesses and destroying anything or attacking anybody they don't like. In terms of Xinjiang, uh, you know, what has happened in Xinjiang, the Chinese view is the same thing that's happened before in every part of China. That is, uh, this is a country that has many, many different languages, local languages. They insisted that everybody learn uh, proper um, uh, Pudonghua, which is the uh, Chinese, the Han Chinese language, uh, so that they could communicate, so that they could be mobile. And they're doing this in Xinjiang. It's a kind of a sinization. Now, it doesn't come without friction. And there are certainly uh, areas where uh, there needs to be sunlight so that people can see that this is, is not a problem. But the reason I, you know, the Chinese government absolutely denies that it's happening. And what you hear are all these reports by people like Adrian Zenz, who says, well, we don't know. So therefore, we infer that the worst is happening. 
If you want to see what's happening that's terrible, go, go to the daily death tolls in Kashmir. You can go to parts of Africa, see what's happening. But those, those somehow are overlooked. And because of the geopolitical rivalry, it is always China that is this horrible, overbearing entity. Well, if that were true, why is it that Xi Jinping is being the adult in the room? Why is he able to overcome you know, the, the, these kind of barbs and arrows that are slung at China on a daily basis to go to a climate change conference hosted by Joe Biden? I think that shows that you know, China is acting that's a, well. But I, I do think that the that's, press should be involved. That's a, that's, a, that's a fair point. That's a point, and I also mentioned that there's a lot of cherry picking with reference to human rights. But let me uh, quickly go back to the technology part of it and to uh, Professor Lal. Uh, Professor Lal, uh, on technology, now the Chinese tech giants, including Huawei, are now working to become completely self-sufficient. And, and that's gonna happen. Now, when Joe Biden tells the Japanese prime minister that they, they must jointly invest in areas and keep China out. That seems like a pipe dream, frankly. I mean, that, that's such an unnecessary statement to make because China is way ahead as far as 5G technology is concerned, as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, as far as quantum computing is concerned, uh, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't really make any sense. Well, I think there's a few issues here. One is, of course, uh, the U.S. and Japan being concerned about supply chain security when it comes to these types of uh, technologies and their applications in both civilian and government use. So there are countries in Asia that are, I mean, not only Japan, but uh, you know, other countries in Southeast Asia as well, who have concerns about information security once they are um, well ensconced inside of uh, China's systems uh, with the 5G and Huawei and so forth. So these are concerns of the U.S. and various of its allies in terms of information security. Now, in terms of practicality, that is the second area. And I do tend to agree with you that China is far ahead currently. Now, having said that, I can also understand the view of the U.S. and Japan in thinking, well, you know, that doesn't mean it's time to give up. It's time to really try harder. And I do think that's important. You don't really want to have a monopoly um, existing in technology in these spheres from any country, whether it's China, Russia, the U.S. I mean, I personally think that it's best to have competition in these areas uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, also to have backups and well, so forth. So I think that it's important. Well, electric vehicles show in Shanghai, you know, Alibaba linked autonomous driving unit, which is Auto X, has partnered with Japan's Honda to ramp up testing on Chinese roads. Now, Baidu uh, on Monday said its Apollo autonomous navigation system would be installed on one million vehicles over the next three to five years. Uh, and so there's so many interdependencies that it doesn't really uh, make much sense to, uh, I mean, I, I understand there have been concerns and all of that, and I'm sure we'll have an occasion to talk about those also. But for now, this will suffice. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Rolly Lal speaking with us. Let me go back to Aina Tangan here. Uh, Aina Tangan, I, I really uh, am kind of, you know, uh, flummoxed by by the fact that you simply cannot try and shut China out. Uh, China is already uh, some paces ahead of the Western world when it comes to AI and you know, computing and third 5G technologies and the rest of it. So this is, to me, quite unnecessary. And I, and I think this is the kind of narrative that China needs to push. Uh, you know, in terms of informing the world of what exactly is happening here. Well, he just, uh, you bring up an excellent point and one that uh, American businesses have embraced. Uh, there have been industry groups have, who have gathered together and they're actually criticizing the U.S. government, which purports to protect them. They're saying that they don't like uh, this, uh, the, uh, the uh, 
ongoing situation with China, which is deteriorating because they depend on it for business. If you're not going to sell into China, where are you going to sell into? It's the largest growing market for everything. Talk to Colgate, GM, uh, Tesla, you name it, across the board, even the tech companies. If you start looking at uh, Intel, uh, Qualcomm, where are they selling? There's $150 billion on the line just from the tech companies. Walmart is here. There's over 350 to $400 billion a year sold um, by U.S. companies who are manufacturing and trading in China. That does not include uh, the, the trade coming in and out. So this idea that you can somehow cut China off and this will help America is nonsense. Plus, all the areas that you mentioned and uh, my colleague has mentioned, uh, the fact is China produces it cheaper. And they're able to do things uh, very well on a very large scale at uh, much lower margins. And as a result, that in essence will be a tax on American, uh, uh, any, any country that cho chooses to embrace that. They will not have uh, these cheaper things. They'll have to pay more. That's a tax on their citizens at a time when the middle class is already shrinking. I don't think this is well thought out. It's one of the uh, problems that I have with Biden. He promised, he came in promising that he was going to compete from the top up. But it seems like he's still just skullduggering around with the same Trump type policies, which are about kicking people uh, around and forcing them by pressure to, in essence, be uh, you know, a, a vassal state to the US. And it's not going to work, whether it's with China or any other country. Stay with me, Aina Tangan. Me now is Dr. Gordon Adams. Professor Emeritus, American University School of International Service, and Distinguished Fellow, Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and Stimson Center. Uh, Professor Adams, thank you for being on the program. We were discussing uh, what Xi Jinping said at the Boao Asia Forum with reference to the current international security architecture and the fact that, as he said, this is an architecture that actually uh, supports the interests of some major powers and not everyone, and this needs to change. Nonetheless, uh, Xi Jinping will also be attending the two-day virtual climate summit starting tomorrow at the invitation of President Biden. Simultaneously, of course, as, as you know, to make things more interesting, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister and the U.S. President have also talked about shutting out China from 5G technology and artificial intelligence and quantum computing and the rest of it. So give me your sense of where things are headed, what are the converging points, what are the areas of divergence, and how things are going to pan out. A very good question. It was an interesting speech that uh, President Xi gave, uh, not terribly different from other talks that have been given by Chinese officials. Uh, and one has the sense that right now both the United States and China are kind of talking past each other, perhaps deliberately. The underlying reality that uh, that President Xi under, was, was stating uh, is that the global power balance has changed. It's not just changing, it has changed. And China is looking forward to the kind of recognition and uh, respect that it thinks a great power like China should have. Uh, the, the United States government, the, the Biden regime, has been kind of talking past this agenda. Uh, and many of the actions that the American uh, administration in the White House has taken in the last couple of months have pointed in a direction of confrontation more than cooperation. It's wonderful, of course, to see President Xi participating uh, in the in the climate change summit that the president is calling. But having met with uh, uh, the uh, uh, prime minister of Japan, having described uh, China in the context of those conversations as an adversary, uh, having uh, announced the first state visit of the United States from uh, South Korean President Moon, uh, and very much China being on the minds of both countries in that conversation. The U.S. is talking about a rules-based order that are the rules that the United States helped create in the 1940s and has continued to play the dominant role in right up to the president. While the Chinese are talking about adjusting those rules, uh, she was very clear to talk about international organizations, UN, WHO, and the like. But uh, it's clear to say that uh, China is going to play a role in those organizations. And as 
China has done is set up other rules on other organizations like the Belt and Road Initiative or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So we have the emergence of two great powers kind of talking past each other, each asserting its own agenda, uh, the United States insisting on the rules-based international order that it helped create, the Chinese insisting that the rules must include everybody at a level of equality. So we do see, I think, a rising confrontation here, a disagreement on the nature of those rules. Uh, and uh, I expect that level of tension and difficulty to continue. Well, when you say it's likely to continue, are you taking a structural realist position on this and saying, you know, this confrontation is inevitable or... Is there a possibility that perhaps through trade interdependencies and the rest of it that we might find some kind of modus vivendi? After all, and before you joined us, I was, you know, in my opening, I was talking about the fact that uh, Japan, Australia, South Korea, Germany, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Russia, EU, uh, and these are just to name a few, uh, they're all the biggest trading partners of China. I mean, for the U.S. itself, China is the second largest after Mexico. Um, France, uh, China is the second biggest export market for France, and so on and so forth. So, and and of course the uh, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is the uh, the world's largest trading bloc, given both the the GDP, global GDP, as well as the global population. So, is this going to be, as uh, Professor Ellison said, a security trap, or is there a possibility of getting out of this trap? be a security scrap, and I think there's going to be some lessons that need to be learned, particularly in Washington, uh, because right now the Biden administration has set out on a path largely of confrontation, uh, reassuring its allies, holding meetings of what's called the Quad, uh, 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 advising the Europeans against what the Europeans did, the EU's trade agreement with uh, China. Uh, and what I think, uh, it comes back to my central point, the power balance has shifted. Other countries are adjusting to those realities. The Australians adjust, the Indonesians, the Malaysians, as you say, and the European Union. And over time, I think the Americans are going to have to learn that they have to live with a different multilateral power balance in the world. She is not just making propaganda here. He is describing a reality that is happening and has already happened. So right now, I'm not ter terribly encouraged by the American administration's approach here because it emphasizes security issues. It emphasizes uh, the independence of the U.S. Uh, supply chain for the U.S. economy. It emphasizes decoupling in exactly the way that she was warning against. Uh, the Chinese have, of course, their own issues. Uh, the U.S. makes human rights declarations about things happening in, uh, to the Uyghurs, uh, things that have happened in Hong Kong, uh, and those are a confrontation with Xi's language about you know, not interfering or meddling, as he said, in other countries' affairs. In other words, we're kind of talking past each other right now. And I think both countries are going to have to do some adjusting for things to reach a more cooperative level. The, the lack of realization of that need for adjustment is not quite come home, I think, in Washington, D.C. I understand your point, Professor Adams, and I think you're right that they are uh, talking past each other. But... Uh, you also seem to imply by saying that that uh, this is going to happen over a short to medium term, but ultimately they will have to start talking and listening to each other. But uh, tell me something, uh, and this has nothing to do with the, the external uh, side of uh, uh, things, uh, more to do with uh, the U.S. domestic politics. How much of uh, President Biden's current uh, sort of strong position on China got to do with the Republicans in the United States. It has so much to do with the Republicans as it has to do with establishing a difference in continuity of approach towards China from the somewhat scattered and disorganized and non-strategic policies that were pursued by his predecessor, who was the Republican president. So uh, I don't think China is going to be as yet a, a domestic political issue in the United States, but the administration clearly is, I think, doing what it thinks it should do to lay out a consistent, coherent, confrontational position, well, a very firm position, if you will, towards China, which was not characteristic of the outgoing administration. Right now, I would say it's not the central issue in American politics. In fact, I was struck that the New York Times barely covered the Bao uh, summit 
uh, and the remarks by uh, President Xi barely covered it. Of course, it was being swamped by domestic politics in the United States, that is to say the conviction of a police officer in Minnesota for uh, the killing of, uh, uh, of a black man uh, last summer in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Minnesota. So that was swamped the coverage, but you have not seen a burst of sudden coverage of Xi's speech. Uh, we're not yet at the point where this is a major political issue in the United States. So I think it's continuity of approach, firmness of approach, more driven by the international view than by domestic politics in the United States. Okay. Thank you so much. That was Professor Gordon Adams speaking with us. Thank you also to Ina Tangan for his insights. We shall take a short break and return to discuss ongoing talks between Iran and the remaining parties to the JCPOA. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. The remaining parties to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action agreed during a joint commission meeting in Vienna's Grand Van Hotel to form a third expert working group to focus on practical steps required to restore the accord. The parties include Iran, China, Russia, Germany, France, and the United Kingdom together with the European Union. Two working groups have spent the past few weeks working on drafting a comprehensive list of the sanctions that the U.S. would need to lift and the nuclear steps Iran would need to reverse in order for all sides to go back into full compliance with the deal. Meanwhile, Iran began to boost its uranium enrichment to a purity of 60% last week in response to an attack on its main nuclear facility in Natanz that damaged an unknown number of centrifuges. Let's go to our panel to discuss what the play here is for Iran. I'm joined by Dr. Kamran Bukhari, Director of Analyst Development at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy, and Hamid Reza Ulam Zadeh, journalist and analyst based in Tehran. Kamran Bukhari, uh, nuclear capability, especially if you are moving towards a weaponization or weapons-grade enrichment, is something highly secret. Iran is putting it in headlines. What do you make of that? Um, it's very simple, Ijaz. Um, Iran is definitely pursuing nuclear weapons, but that's not an immediate goal. That's a slow-moving process. Uh, it's, it's a secondary objective. Uh, the primary objective is to not acquire nuclear weapons, but to weaponize a nuclear weapons program uh, or a nuclear program uh, to be able to extract concessions uh, from the United States and the international community. In this case, the lifting of financial sanctions that are really biting Iran, and, and it's really a, a strain on the uh, uh, on the regime in the sense that it cannot balance its domestic political imperatives with its ambitious and aggressive foreign policy there's only so much money and you have to allocate it equitably and so i think in order to be able to have its cake and eat it uh, iran needs these this sanctions relief it thought it got it when it cut the deal with the obama administration then that deal was nixed by the trump administration and uh it, dashing the hopes of tehran and so i think uh, tehran is trying to get back to that and again you know it's it's a bargaining chip it's a it's leverage right now so so when iran says we are going to go for 60% purity of uranium enrichment, uh, it is something, and, and you know, saying it very overtly and doing it very overtly, it's just a bargaining chip. It's not something that they want to do. They're just saying, we are going to do this unless you do this, this, this. Is, is that, have I got you right? Exactly. I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, if they were really enriching uranium at those levels, they wouldn't be telling us. They would keep it as the most highly right. guarded state secret. It would be very difficult to find out what is exactly happening. The fact that they're telegraphing it is basically saying, look, uh, we're going to do this. If you don't want us to do this, then, you know, uh, give us our money or, or, you know, pay us. So it's, it's, it's very simple. At the end of the day, it is a negotiation. Uh, and, in the, and in negotiation, you need leverage. 
This is the leverage that the Iranians have. And I would want to add that if they were really, you know, rushing to the nuclear red line, uh, they would be risking airstrikes uh, by, you know, Israel, by the United States, uh, because that's something that's not tolerable. They know it, yet they're doing it. And so the only explanation is that they're not actually doing that in any in, in earnest. It's a it's kind of like North Korea la launching rockets in order to get the United States to the table because the regime is isolated from the world. It needs uh, economic financial relief. And that's the game here. Yeah, but in the process, no, it's actually developed an ICBM, which which actually is a threat to the United States. It is. It is. Uh, um, it's, the North Korean analogy isn't perfect. No analogy is ever perfect. Uh, they do have an actual weapons capability. Uh, you know, they have a nuclear weapon by all accounts. It's, uh, it's, 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 you, they have a device, if you will. Uh, I don't think, Sorry. by all accounts, that they have merged the nuclear weapons technology with ballistic missile capability. And if, in fact, if you watch their tests uh, that they keep doing, it shows a certain crude element, uh, or at least they're at a very early stage of long-range ballistic missiles. Yes, they threaten South Korea and Japan and, uh, and, and Taiwan, but I don't think they're at that stage where they have an actual deliverable missile capability that could strike the, the, the western seaboard of the United States. That's a very interesting uh, observation. Uh, I, this program is not about this, but I'll definitely take this up with you bilaterally at some point. But let me pull in Hamid Reza into this. Hamid Reza, so Kamran Bukhari is saying, you guys aren't really doing this. You don't really want to do this, but this is your leverage and you, you know, using this leverage and at the same time talking in Vienna and saying things are, you know, going fine so far. When Iran said I would uh, go for 20 persons enrichment at the very beginning years ago, and uh, the West, Western countries denied the capability and said that Iran is not capable of doing that, and yet Iran did that. You know, the mistake that Cameron is making is the same that many others in Washington are doing is a miscalculation based on a uh, misjudgment, based on a wrong assumption. You know, the, this, this cognitive bias that exists there that Iran is pursuing nuclear weapon is actually uh, affecting their judgment and their calculation. That is the mistake. Iran is not seeking the uh, nuclear bomb or a nuclear weapon, and that's why it is loudly and overtly saying that it is enriching to 60 percent, because Iran is adhering to, simply adhering to international laws and international regulations. Iran is adhering to IAEA uh, regulations, and it says that uh, since I am the member, I, I am entitled to all the rights that it gives me. Gives me, and I am enriching, and I'm announcing that because it is based on the regulations of the agency to announce uh, beforehand that you are doing so and so. Uh, so there is nothing behind that. Iran is not pursuing the nuclear weapon and because of that it is uh, saying that because it's something that it is its own right. Uh, the other point that, but uh, of course I do agree but uh, by, with uh, Kamran in, the, in terms of leverage that yes, one uh, use of that enrichment is a leverage. Because all the things that Iran has done since 2019, uh, that about 14 months after U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA, everything has been to uh, force the European countries and the Americans to get back to the uh, nuclear deal. Uh, yeah, the, everything that Iran has taken, all the measures, all the steps to reduce the commitments and such things, Everything Iran has always said, that it's not something uh, secret, it, it has been said overtly and repeatedly, that Iran is taking the measures. Because, first, based on paragraphs 26 and 36 of the JCPOA, Iran is uh, supposed to accept the limitation in return to receiving some economic benefits and some measures being taken by the other parties. And, uh, for, and uh, because of that, Iran is retaining them. 
the, the commitments. Uh, so uh, why is not receiving that? It is doing those things. And it has said that as soon as they get back to the commitments, as soon as the, the, the sanctions are lifted, and after everyone else is back to the JCPOA, Iran will get back to JCPOA momentarily. So it doesn't mean that Iran is going to stop. Iran is going to develop the, the nuclear program. Iran is going to uh, advance the, the centrifuges to upgrade the centrifuges. Actually, it was usually IR1 uh, being implemented, being working. Now it is uh, IR6 that is actually turning in, in uh, facilities here in Iran, producing 60%. So yes, Iran is producing uh, the 60% enrichment, enriched uranium, and it doesn't have any use for Iran to just claim about that. Iran is producing it uh, normally as a normal country, okay. as a normal procedure within the IAEA, and there is nothing to hide about that. Okay, so let me quickly go back to what you said about cognitive bias. Now, you're saying that there's a cognitive bias, uh, the people in Washington think that Iran wants nuclear weapons capability, which it does not want. Uh, so I have a very simple question, frankly, which is if Iran does not want uh, nuclear weapons capability, what exactly is Iran developing long-range ballistic missiles for? You obviously don't need a missile that strikes a target at 2,000 or 2,500 kilometers with a tactical warhead. You know, one of the main uh, aspects is to uh, there is deterrence actually to deter other enemies uh, from targeting Iran. Uh, Iran has not uh, attacked any country for centuries, and it, you know, it's uh, going on right now, Iran is not a country to begin any war, but it needs to defend itself as we have seen in several cases just uh, less than two years ago we had uh, assassination of General Soleimani, just six months ago we had assassination of uh, Fakhri Zadeh, our uh, nuclear scientist, we have had two attacks on our nuclear facilities by Israelis, so uh, as a country being uh, uh, frequently targeted by others, Iran needs to defend itself, and this defense okay, needs so to Iran be is developing, powerful. So Iran is developing long-range missiles for self-defense. Uh, I have to wrap up the program also so quickly, going back to Kamran Bukhari. Give me your thoughts on Iranian uh, missile uh, program and whether that is an indication of whether Iran wants to develop a nuclear weapons capability or whether that simply is something which Iran is doing for self-defense. Look, I mean, every state develops, uh, you know, defensive capabilities, you know, ballistic missile. Uh, very few have developed uh, nuclear weapons capability. Uh, the, the issue here is that, uh, first of all, I'd like to correct Hamid Raza. Uh, it, it, the Iranians attacked the Saudi oil facility, which then triggered the assassination of General Soleimani. So we need to keep the sequence right. So yes, you know, uh, Iran may have not declared war in a very, very long time on another country, uh, but Iran is attacking, uh, did attack Saudi Arabia, and I'm not even going into the proxy war that Iran engages in 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 Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen, uh, through its intelligence services and through the IRGC Quds Force. So, uh, you know, to say that it's not attacked, uh, you know, yes. There has been no declaration of war, and there has not been any formal war, but there is, this is the new war. This is how you make war. So I wanted to uh, uh, make that clear. Now, look, we don't go by intentions here. So if a country is developing uh, you know, a deterrent, uh, everybody else has to assume that it's not just for defensive purposes, that at some point, when it is to the advantage of the actor in question, it will use it for offensive purposes. So there is that. Then, uh, you know, how can we tell what is really going on in Iranian nuclear facilities? Yes, the IAEA was there, but does the IAEA have access to every single lab, every single facility in the country? IAEA isn't like, you know, cannot parachute itself into the country. It requires Iranian authorities to allow it access. And it can only go to those places that they know of and that they can actually verify 
what else is going on. Uh, I know this is speculation, but this is what you have to do in military and strategic matters. You have to speculate. You can't just assume based on intent that, oh, you know, a country has said we will never create nuclear weapons, yet it has, it is enriching to 60 percent, uh, which is a different argument, and I won't go into it for the because of the brevity of time. But uh, you have to assume worst case scenario. That's how military doctrine, that's how strategic planning is done. And, you know, intentions can all be good and we can have tea in Vienna or, or Geneva. But there is a history and it's a very long one. It's 40 years old. And every actor has to base its calculations looking at that history, looking at the imperatives and the constraints of the Islamic Republic. Okay, I have run out of time, but force me to go back to Hamid's Reza for a final response, but Hamid Reza, very quickly, you've got just a minute to do that. By his argument, if Iran is supposed to consider the worst case scenario, Iran needs to actually develop some, some missile program. But all the things that Hamid said are just claims. Iran never actually attacked Saudi Arabia. There were some proxies, maybe. But it's not called a war. It, proxy war is not something attacked by Iran. Iran it has been fighting the terrorist groups. All things, things are correct. But uh, saying that uh, IAEA doesn't have access to nuclear facilities, it's just uh, ridiculous. You know? IAEA has admitted that it has uh, most unprecedented and strongest observation and monitoring systems in Iran. So uh, well, how can it be you know, if they could have access to anywhere, anytime? Based on the JCPOA. Okay, great. Thank you, Kamran Bukhari. Thank you to Hamid Reza, Ghulam Sadeh, for speaking with us. This is all from InFocus this week. We should see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at Indus.news. And given the third COVID wave in Pakistan and across the world, stay safe and follow the non vaccine safety protocols. Good night and goodbye.